This is a very brief talk on inflammatory type hepatic adenomas. This is a 45-year-old female, which is the classic demographics for a hepatic adenoma. He has a very low power view of the lesion. Everything down here is normal liver. Everything up here is a hepatic adenoma. And I want you to pay attention to these little blue balls that are scattered all throughout the lesion. Of course, the first thing you do are to decide when you see one of these lesions, is, is the liver benign or is the liver malignant? There's an entirely different talk that covers benign versus malignant liver. But for the sake of this discussion, the plates are one cell thick, there's no atypia, there's low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, there is no mitotic activity. Take it from me, this is benign. Remember those blue balls? Here's one of them. You can see these inflammatory cells aggregated together with perhaps some vessels in there. But this is what the blue balls were really composed of. Inflammatory cells, lymphocytes, plasma cells, but in addition to that, there are these bile ductule-like structures. Now these aren't classic bile ductules. They stain like bile ductules, as you'll see in a minute. They stain with keratin-19, but they don't have open lumens like bile ductules. These look a little like portal tracts. In fact, I refer to these as portal tract-like structures. Now, this is one exception to the rule that hepatic adenomas are a pure population of hepatocytes. The exception to that rule is that inflammatory type adenomas, in addition to hepatocytes, also often show these bile ductules. And if you don't believe me, these are indeed bile ductules, as you can see from this keratin-19 stain. All right, so first things first, classification of hepatic adenomas. They are broadly three types of adenomas. The HNF1 alpha inactivated adenomas that I prefer calling fatty adenomas because they show fat. There's the inflammatory adenoma and there's the beta catenin activated adenoma. Now, if you notice this lesion did have a bit of fat, and hence I consider it a fatty adenoma. The key immunohistochemical stain is LFABP. And as you can see here, the LFABP is intact. That essentially rules out a fatty adenoma. All right, so if it's not a fatty adenoma, how about an inflammatory adenoma? It did have these inflammatory nodules, these portal tract-like structures. The key immunohistochemical stain for an inflammatory adenoma is serum amyloid A. Now this is a challenging antibody. It's hard to get it to work. Nevertheless, look at the stain. It's at the very least focally positive. The periphery is positive. Granted, the center is largely negative, but this is positive. I, I confess it doesn't warm my heart. In fact, this stain seldom warms my heart, but you've got to give it to me. This is positive. And we had the right histology and we have some immunohistochemical confirmation. So indeed, it does appear to be an inflammatory hepatic adenoma. And now you're asking yourself, why is this man showing me a glutamine synthetase stain? I thought that was for focal nodular hyperplasia where you see map-like staining. I'll let you know in a minute. For now, take a look at the stain. This is what normal liver looks like. And then there is the lesion, most of which is negative. Only the periphery is positive and the periphery is strongly positive. So why the glutamine synthetase stain or the GS stain? Well, it turns out, if you go back to the classification, the HNF1 alpha inactivated adenomas have virtually no risk of transformation to HCC. The beta catenin activated adenomas have an extremely high risk of transformation to HCC. The inflammatory adenomas, aha, they have an intermediate risk of progression. So some of them progress to HCC and some of them do not progress. And the GS stain can help us distinguish who progresses and who does not progress. So the strong but focal staining here, peripheral staining, by focal I mean less than 50%, that pattern of staining is associated with a low risk of malignant transformation. And if you must know, it's associated with one specific exon 3 beta catenin mutation as well as other exon 7 and 8 mutations. And you're probably asking yourselves, why not do a beta catenin stain, right? They're beta catenin mutations. Fortunately, unfortunately, even though you have a beta catenin mutation in hepatic adenomas, in many hepatic adenomas, 
you do not see nuclear reactivity for beta catenin. Right, so that's an inflammatory type adenoma with potentially a low risk of transformation to HCC. How about this, another young female with a hepatic mass? So here's a very low power view and I can assure you this did not fulfill criteria for a hepatocellular carcinoma. Take it from me, it looked benign. So there's clearly a little bit of fat, but what I want you to pay attention is to this structure right here. That looks somewhat like a portal tract-like structure. I'll freely admit it's imperfect. There is some resemblance. Well, the closest I could fit this is what was into an inflammatory type hepatic adenoma. And do remember, there are cases that you simply cannot classify into one of these categories. So do not feel embarrassed in leaving it unclassified. So I did try some immunohistochemistry. The serum amyloid A is focally positive. This isn't great, but nevertheless, I had some evidence to support an inflammatory type adenoma. Whether this is an inflammatory type adenoma or not almost pales into insignificance when you look at this image. The entire, all of the cores are strongly positive for glutamine synthetase and now I'm trying to address the risk of progression of this lesion. Also notice there's a small piece of normal liver here. And as is often the case, the beta catenin stain was negative. So this clearly showed diffuse, strong GS staining, which implies that this patient has a very high risk of transforming into a hepatocellular carcinoma. And although whether a hepatic adenoma is resected or not, is really a conversation based on size, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, between the patient and the surgeon. When you do see diffuse GS staining like this, this is another strong indication to resect the tumor. So if the, if the surgeon is considering not resecting this tumor, this should tip the balance. And this diffuse staining generally, but not always, correlates with most exon 3 mutations. Most exon 3 mutations are associated with a high risk of malignant transformation. All right, so one final case. This is a 45-year-old female, portal tract-like structures. I don't really see a bile duct, but there are certainly inflammatory cells and naked arterioles. Here's another portal tract-like structure, and perhaps I can imagine a bile ductule right here. Ooh, and I love when this happens, when the SAA stain works really nicely. Notice this diffuse, strong reactivity for SAA. This is an inflammatory type hepatic adenoma. And the glutamine synthetase stain was essentially negative, which implies that this would have had a very low risk of transforming to HCC. So a negative GS stain implies a very low risk of transforming to an HCC and that typically corresponds to these kinds of beta catenin mutations. So a very quick spiel on GS patterns and risk of malignancy in hepatic adenomas. When you see diffuse GS staining, diffuse and strong staining, that typically means high level of beta catenin activation and a high risk of transforming to HCC. When you have either a focal or heterogeneous pattern, which is less than 50% of strong staining or peripheral border staining, that translates into a low risk of beta catenin activation and a low risk of transformation. Now, is this perfect? The answer is no, because what is focal and what is diffuse, particularly on a biopsy, becomes very problematic. And as you can imagine, if we are to use this in practice, it needs to work on a biopsy. It's imperfect, but it's the best way we have in assessing risk of malignant transformation in an inflammatory type hepatic adenoma. All right, so let's contrast the inflammatory type hepatic adenomas with the other two hepatic adenoma subtypes. Let's talk about the fatty adenoma characterized by a lot of fat and loss of reactivity with LFABP and the beta catenin activated adenoma that shows significantly more cellular atypia. Notice these thickened trabeculae and the high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios and the nuclear reactivity for beta catenin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a review of inflammatory type hepatic adenomas.